So we're at the very bottom of the uh, PDF lecture notes number 29 from 706, which I'll also upload to the 757 web area, because this is material that I never got a chance to cover when I made the lectures for 706, although uh, I, I very much like to cover it. And so we have to do it uh, here in 757. So we just found out how when we're doing 3D migration through constant velocity, what we need are basically for the imaging condition, the travel times from exploding reflectors. Uh, and we're talking about, uh, of course, zero offset migration here in three dimensions. And so we need those travel times from the exploding reflectors, like down here in, inside this cube, up to some surface point at uh, x0 and y0 on the, on the top of the cube. And what we saw is uh, at the end of the last lecture is that we can get that perfectly with the travel time equations that, that we use in 2D, first, say, in, in x and then in y. And so the, the squares of the, of the times all add together perfectly, and we have no problem. It becomes the uh, very simple 3D Pythagorean, Pythagorean solution. So what this means is that at least you know, where the travel time equations are so simple uh, and form Pythagorean uh, um, hypotenuses, and, and of course that means where velocity is constant, that means that we can fully separate the process. The, the operators are perfectly, uh, they, are, they are, of course, already split algebraically, and they're perfectly commutative. So the, um, it doesn't matter what order we do it in. We could step down you know, one delta z at a, at a time, but we can also go the whole way. We can also migrate all the way to, to z at the depth of our exploding reflector. And we can do it first all in, say, y with the y equation. And then we can do it, we can come back later and feed the result of that into an x direction migration and do it all in x. So that's full separability. And you know, when we can do that, we have an enormous computational advantage. Okay? The first computational advantage, which is not to be sneezed at, is that you can use your existing 2D codes, right? Why, you know, um, if you're uh, if you're just trying to get started, if you're trying to do tests, if you're trying to get a project done quick, you know, why develop a whole new 3D code when you can just use your existing 2D codes? Okay, um, you've probably spent, uh, you know, you may have spent years validating and verifying your, your 2D codes. And uh, you know, it takes a period. It takes uh, papers. It takes uh, lots of projects to verify and validate a new 3D code. So you can, if you can handle the 3D case perfectly you know, with, with no um, using your existing 2D codes, you know, and, and if you have full separability, you know, you have algebraic equivalence. There's no, it's not an approximation at all. So um, that's a, a tremendous advantage. And then, of course, there's the computational speed, which, you know, as, as geophysicists have ever larger data sets uh, to analyze, you know, our, our computers are never growing quite as fast as our uh, uh, and our access to computers is never growing quite as, quite as fast as our data sets. So we still need every computational advantage that we can get. So any, you know, anything that you're doing that, uh, that allows full separability, you've still got to do it with, um, um, you've still got to do it with uh, the, um, um, with the 2D codes and save that time. And I just want to go back to a, uh, 
uh, an earlier diagram here. Okay, you know, so this is showing the the progressive migration of of each plane in uh, uh, at constant y, and then each plane at constant x, right? With the two D codes, that's the idea. So the idea of uh, s fully separable calculations is that you use your two D code to migrate each of these uh, each of these planes. And and then uh, you feed the output of one direction's migration into the into the other direction's migration, and then successively use your two D code on each of the planes. Uh, and there's a third advantage I just thought of. <clears throat> um, if you have a parallelized um, and 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 this kind of code, this kind of you know multiple application, because the the uh, the 2D ap code application, the 2D migration application to each plane is entirely independent of the application of the, of the same 2D code to the plane next door. All right? So you can just run your code on, say, uh, uh, if you have 1,000 um, planes of constant y, right? This uh, data volume is, uh, is 1,000 deep. Then um, uh, you just you just get hold of a thousand uh, core machine, which is not uh, not that hard to find these days, and you run your two D code, you know, once, uh, and you feed it uh, you feed each core a different plane, and so you get your uh, you know this is incredibly this kind of thing is very very easy to parallelize, uh, probably a more difficult task to parallelize the uh, the transpose. But once you've transposed it, then you have a similarly, you know, ridiculously easy to parallelize um, task in migrating uh, on the, the all the constant x planes, which you could do all at once. Okay, so that's advantage number three of full separability. Um, is is uh, you know being able to parallelize it so easily that you could surprise your 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 client or your boss. Uh, by uh, you know bringing back the result in an hour instead of in in uh, in days. So uh, you know tremendous motivation here for um, finding the ability to do full separability. So we got to ask, okay, here at uh, page one fifty six in uh, the seven oh six uh, lecture number twenty nine. When is our 3D migration operator fully separable. Okay, we're going to look at the velocity, of course, um, and uh, we'll do it through the uh, lens, so to speak, <coughs> of the 15 degree 3D dispersion relation. Okay, so that says that dkdz, which we use, you know, that's the vertical gradient of the wave field. Um, we use that uh, the vertical derivative of the wave field. We use that. Um, I'm sorry, that's k sub z, right? Which you know, is the Fourier dual of dk dz. Okay. So anyway, that uh, that's the uh, wave number that um, that gives us the uh, uh, the vertical gradient, uh, the vertical derivative of the wave field, which is what we need for downward continuation. Okay. So k sub z is equal to minus omega over v plus v over two omega times the quantity kx squared plus ky squared. So we convert that to a wave equation. We'll, uh, you know, that's just a uh, dispersion relation, right? So we uh, we just slap in the Fourier duals. Make sure we get the signs right. Okay, keep it in uh, in omega, and um, so this is uh, short for dpdz. It's the z derivative of the wave field, um, and it depends on uh, frequency, of course, minus i omega over v plus I v over two omega, and now we've taken uh, the uh, the x direction and the y direction derivatives out of the Fourier domain, and we put them back into the uh, physical domain. So we have the second partial uh, derivative with respect to x, and the second partial derivative with respect to y, and this operator then is applied to the wave field. Okay, you apply it to the wave field at whatever depth, and you get the uh, the uh, the depth uh, gradient of the wave field, if you like. 
Now notice that we can split this particular operator. Um, there's nothing here that uh, that there's no term in here. Uh, like if this quantity here uh, was squared, right? Then we would have terms that ha were the um, you know would be uh, d squared dy squared multiplied by d squared dx squared, or you know think of it in operator terms. Uh, d squared dy squared operating on d squared dx squared operating on the wave field. We don't have terms like that. Okay, so there's no cross terms, so we can algebraically divide and split the operator to two parts. So here's the the split out operator. Okay, so dp dz is equal to the sum of these two operators. You know, all operating on the uh, wave field. Operator a is minus i omega over two v plus i v over two omega um, times uh, d squared dx squared, right? Operator there, right? You just to actually do the operation, right? You distribute the wave field back in, okay? Uh, and then operator b, which gets added to that, is minus i omega over two v plus i v over two omega uh, times d squared dy squared. Okay. So in the omega domain, that's our uh, that's our fifteen degree three d uh, operator now just you know written out in a little a little more elaborately as two separate operators. Okay, so we identify the green one as A and the purple one as B. So for full separability, A and B must commute, which means that if you take the wave field and you uh, you apply B first in the y direction, and then you apply A, you get exactly the same result. As if you took the wave field and you applied A first, and then you applied B. Okay, so here's the here's the criterion. Here's the problem: why we don't always get full separability. If we have our velocity is laterally variable, velocity is a function of x, y, and z in either A or B or both. Okay. Then these operators will not formally commute. Okay. Um, so uh, uh, now they don't commute. We can't use full separation. We can always use splitting. Okay. Uh, you know, just just by the virtue of being able to write the operators separately, then um, if we if we creep down in an approximate process and and uh, we have lots of z steps. Then our our split process uh, will not be a bad approximation. It'll be a pretty accurate approximation. Okay, so we can still split. Yeah. Does that count for even uh, velocity models or reflectors that are very laterally uh, variable? Well, well, so so. Is there like a limit where it's too laterally variable and that's no longer a good approximation? Okay, so 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 uh, yes, there is, but. Um, you know, in the formalism here, right? Um, what's the what's the deal? Um, you know, in this case, both a and b contain a horizontal derivative. Okay, the d squared dx squared and the d squared dy squared. Okay, now here's the uh, here's the velocity, right? And and so if you um, if you have you know, so let's say say we apply the B operator first, okay, and um, uh, and in applying the B operator, we're also applying this velocity v. It's and it appears two places here, okay. So that leaves a uh, a a a dependency on that on that velocity in the in the result of applying B to the wave field, okay. Where, as I could just say, you know, b times p. Okay, um, so that le let's say the velocity now has a dependency on um, on x. Okay, that's going to leave the result of the uh, b of the y direction operation b. It's going to have a dependency on x. And then that is going to get operated on by the horizontal x derivative in A. Likewise, if the if the wave field has 
a uh, dependency on uh, uh, if the velocity is a dependency on on y, you know that's going to get uh, operated on. It doesn't get operated on explicitly by uh, no. It gets operated on explicitly by by uh, by b, and then further with a. So those that kind of dependency, you know, if um, if there's a, a vertical derivative, if there's a horizontal derivative in either A or B, whatever operator we're using, and here there it's in both. There's horizontal derivatives in both, either one, x or y, okay. And if there's either x or y dependency uh, uh, of velocity, then formally you don't split. I mean, formally you can't fully separate. Okay. Now let's let's look at the question that you asked. Okay. How bad does it have to be? Okay. Um, all right. So so so. Uh, but I, let me before we do that, I just want to note that if velocity is a function of of depth only, right? Notice that a and b do not contain depth derivatives, z derivatives. <clears throat> what that means is that is that uh, a and b would commute. So. <laughs> so for uh, for uh, time migration, with no um, and and okay, have to go to number thirty. I, I split these in a bad place. Okay, we go to number thirty, and uh, we see that if dv dx or and dv dy are close to zero, but not exactly zero. If they're slowly varying, if we would be willing to use a thin lens term. Okay, because they're slowly varying, then you know full separation is not going to be that far off. All right, so um, that's the uh, um, you know that explains the 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 utility of time migration. You can split it, uh, and well, no, you can you can always split it, but you can fully separate it. All right. So the um, the full uh, the full separation, um, you know, brings you so many advantages that it's it's very much worthwhile processing it first with in three D with a with a fully separated uh, routine, and uh, and then seeing where you still have velocity error, and that's what held back uh, you know seismic exploration in the Great Basin. Because uh, there are too many places where dv dx and dv dy are not anywhere near close to zero, okay, and so you know time migration was not useful, okay. You have to you have to do depth migration, which means that you have to know the lateral velocity variation accurately, okay. Remember, it doesn't matter about your algorithm. It, it's it's your vol your knowledge of velocity and your confidence in your lateral velocity variation assessments that really make the difference between time migration and depth migration. Okay, and you know if you don't have if you don't have good assessments of lateral velocity variation, you might as well use a fully split time migration. Get what you can out of that quickly. Right, because uh, uh, you know you're not going to get any advantage. You're not going to get any more information, really. You're not going to focus any more reflectors until you you've gone to the trouble of developing that 3D velocity information. So um, you know this this uh, uh, um, uh, this little note here at the uh, at the top of uh, of the 706 uh, lecture number 30 notes, um, that's really the uh, the whole uh, the whole issue. You know, we we no problem. You know, we can do any time migration. We can have any crazy velocity distribution with depth. It can change sharply. If there can be velocity inversions, all that is just fine, and we can fully split our 3D um, 15 degree uh, extrapolator. Okay, now that was the fifteen degree extrapolator, right? 
which you remember from 706. What about, you know, say the 45 degree extrapolator, you know, which we would want for larger dips, right? Uh, you know, if we're if we're only using the 15 degree extrapolator, right? We're not we're not getting really close to um, we're not getting really close to to getting steep dips anyway, right? Um, because uh, you know they're going to be uh, you know even if we have a 90 degree uh, a very prominent 90 degree uh, reflector, um, it's going to be uh, weakened and and uh, you know shown falsely at a much lower dip. Um, by a 15 degree uh, uh, migration. So um, here's the uh, 3D uh, continued fraction square root approximation, you know, via Muir's method that you found out about um, in 706. So its k sub z is equal to omega over v, and on the top you've got uh, one minus three v squared over four omega squared, and in, in 706 where we had k x squared, k sub x squared. Here we have k sub x squared plus k sub y squared, that quantity. And on the bottom, um, we have uh, almost the same thing, 1 minus v squared over 4 omega squared times the quantity k sub x squared plus k sub y squared. Now notice that the denominator down here has got both kx and ky in it. All right? So we can't, write, we can't even write this equation in two parts where one depends only on kx and one depend and the other depends on ky. So the 45 degree extrapolator, darn, you can't even split it. And if you can't split it, you can't fully separate it. Okay? We can't even do the algebra to, to write the split operator. So we're kind of hung out to dry. Okay? So Dave Brown said, well, I, I'm not going to give up here. Uh, I'm going to make a, a, you know, I'm going to uh, forget about Muir's uh, um, Approximation. Let me just make another approximation, and let me keep it. Let me make it split it, splitable. So here's the wide angle, you know, steep dip dispersion uh, relation for uh, that involves both k x and k y, right? So that's the that's the dispersion relation. It's got the square root in there. All right. So so Dave Brown said, all right, let me just let me just split that from the get go. Okay, and he he split it like this, um, and and notice that that this is now, you know, we're splitting we're splitting it back at the uh, at the dispersion relation. Okay, so if you remember that, we can now for each one, we can use any approximation we want, and notice that this is exactly the same. It's exactly the same. Um, uh, exactly the same. Uh, dispersion relation that we use in our in our 2D codes. So whatever whatever uh, you know, whether it's um, uh, FK migration or or uh, finite difference migration, and whether it's uh, uh, five degree, fifteen degree, forty five degree, sixty degree. Okay, all of those are covered by this by this split approximation. All right. I mean, we're a little uncomfortable here because we we. You know, we had to split it. You know, we're making an approximation here, way back at the dispersion curve stage. Okay, before we even approximate the square root um, to to get our uh, our finite difference uh, wave equations. Um, but you know, that beats this situation where uh, we're just hung out to dry. Okay. All right. So uh, in case of z. Is equal to minus omega over v applied to all of this, okay, and um, it's uh, the square root of the quantity one minus v squared kx squared over omega squared, and then you add the the radical of one minus v squared k sub y squared over omega squared, and then you got to subtract one, okay. So that's the uh, that's the approximation that Dave Brown proposed. Um, and I um, and I and I want to make a couple of notes here. Okay. So the two star equation is the approximation of the one star equation. Okay. When is the two star equation exactly, precisely equal to the one star equation? Well, if kx equals zero, okay, then uh, it becomes 
exactly the one star equation okay, when kx equals 0. If ky equals 0, the two star equation is an exact representation of the one star equation. Okay? So um, now when is uh, when is kx equal to zero? Okay, that means there's no slope in x. Alright? So let's let's say x is our the x direction is our inline direction. Okay? And the y direction is our cross line direction. Um, so if you look at a uh, a wave field, okay, uh, like like a uh, zero offset three D survey, and you look at the wave field, and in the inline direction it's all flat, okay, that would give you k x equal to zero, okay. And what does that mean? You know, the waves are are, are arriving at the whole inline all at once. That just means the waves are, are traveling in the y direction. They're traveling cross line. Okay? What if ky equals 0? And this is a very, actually a very typical assumption. Whenever we do a 2D survey instead of a 3D survey, we're assuming this. Okay? That means the waves are all traveling in line. You look at the cross lines, and you see flat reflections. The waves are all traveling in line. Right? That's a, uh, you know, whenever we, we, we execute, you know, whenever we dare to do a, uh, uh, a 2D survey instead of a 3D survey, we're assuming right there that k sub y is equal to zero, and the waves are only traveling in the inline direction. Okay, so for that, for that, uh, for either of those situations, this this is not an approximation. This this you know Dave Brown split dispersion relation is perfect. Okay, Joe. I was going to say, what's the need to approximate the one star equation if the two star equation is, is longer? It doesn't seem like it's that much more simplified. Oh, it's, 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 it's uh, uh, you know, this one is, uh, is, is, uh, um, is definitely more complicated, yeah. but it's, it's split. Okay, so so you know right here you recognize a uh, the dispersion relation for a um, uh, for an x direction migration, and right here is is the entirely split um, migration for a y direction migration. Okay, I see. Yeah, and and we're just trying to get ourselves out of this pickle we had ourselves in here, um, where we had. We had a, a, a forty-five degree three D uh, migration operator that we couldn't even we couldn't even uh, split. Okay, so so you know this uh, uh, yeah Joe. I was going to say, but if you have anything that's not flat, then you can't use that as approximation, right? Because it becomes increasingly less valid. So if you have like any right. structures like faults or ditching beds or synclines or anticlines, then that's not a good approximation. Well, if you're if you if you've got cylindrical symmetry, right, and uh, let's say your inlines are crossing all the all the uh, structure, and all the structure strikes in the y direction, right, then your uh, your ky's are always zero, okay, and 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 this is then this is not an approximation in your your two D migrations are perfect okay um, okay so so what you know what is the problem all right okay it's it's waves you know here's an X and y map and here's a wave that's propagating 45 degrees out of out of X and y okay that's the one that is you know that azimuth and of course the azimuth that's uh, 90 degrees from that, those are the ones that are most in error. Okay. Uh, now, what what Brown shows is that even in this case, whatever approximation you use for the square roots, none of it is is any worse than the fifteen degree approximation. So here's what you here's what you get according to Dave Brown. You you use his uh, his split uh, dispersion relation. Okay. 
And then you know you develop whatever 2D migration codes you want. Well, and of course you've already got lots of 2D migration codes. All right. So um, uh, and you do your 3D migration fully separated. Okay. And if if the if you have a 90 degree structure that's dipping um, in the x direction, or if you have a 90 degree structure that's dipping in the in the y that's dipping in the y direction, and I'm actually outlining the strikes here. Okay, let's say your 90 degree dipping structure is is striking in the y direction, or you have a 90 degree structure that's striking in the um, in the x direction. Okay, those you know wide angle those steep dip structures, they will come in exactly as well as your migration program can bring them in in 3D. I mean in 2D. Okay, they'll be fine. If you have a, a 90 degree dipping structure that is 45 degrees off that azimuth, or, or one of those azimuths, then you're not going to see it. What you can see at that 45 degree azimuth is always going to be you know, 15, 15 degree dip or better, you'll always get. Okay, that's what Dave Brown showed in his paper, is that you'll, you'll always be able to get that, um, that off strike structure Okay, that 45 degree azimuth structure, um, you can get its dip accurately up to 15 degrees, no matter what you do. Okay, um, and then it's so. So I think we're answering your question pretty well here. All right, you can use a split process. You can um, you can get you have a chance of getting wide angle structure that's either in the in the has the x or the y direction strike. Okay. And the worst you're going to do is for these 45 degree uh, strikes, you're not going to see steep structure, but you will see accurately. You'll see and accurately locate structure uh, that's dipping up to 15 degrees. So I think that's a, a a pretty decent answer to your query. And you get the you know you get the ability to um, uh, to use your your same 2D programs. You get the the that that have already been vetted. You get your um, your your high uh, ease of parallelization. Um, you get fast time, fast processing time. Um, you know you um, um, you know we already know that you can't uh, you can't get uh, um, you know you're just doing time migration. You can't really do uh, um, 3D uh, uh, depth migration this way. Um, but uh, uh, you get you get some pretty incredible speed, so um, you know this is a, a, a superb way of getting you started. Uh, Brown goes on and and uh, suggests a uh, forty five degree approximation for um, uh, this uh, for his uh, split dispersion curve. Okay, and you can see it's very similar to the uh, <coughs> the forty five degree approximation that. Um, that we had uh, in uh, back in 706, and uh, he turns this into two separated wave equations. You know, one for um, um, you know one for x direction migration and one for y direction migration. Okay, and uh, you know through that by actually writing out the operators and the uh, and the wave equations, that's how Dave Brown shows that uh, um, you know you. Um, if you have, you know, whatever velocity changes you want in uh, in z in depth, you're fine. You can use full separation without any approximation. And then, if you want to be accurate in uh, uh, in three D velocity space, you know, where velocity varies in x and or y, uh, then you've got to use splitting. Uh, but again, you know that that. Um, you know that brings the uh, the burden on you. You know you're not going to go to all that trouble of using splitting and having to transpose at every z step, unless you're really confident in your in in your velocity variations and how they work in x and y. Okay, so uh, you know we haven't lightened the burden of of really going to to depth migration here. Um, I've just showed you how to do 3D time migration in a very convenient way. All right. 
Now, this kind of procedure we can apply to, to other uh, types of multidimensional problems. Okay? So um, you know, let's, let's look at some examples. Uh, and we're kind of, you know, we're going to back up, you know, kind of deep into 706 now, um, just, to, just to refresh your memory. Um, you know, now I formally explained splitting. It turns out we've been using it all the time. We used it in, in uh, um, you know, probably all, um, um, you know, uh, uh, lab six, lab seven, and lab eight. It's also used in lab nine, if you did that, um, back in seven oh six. So let's consider um, let's consider uh, the uh, zero offset wave field or constant offset wave field in two dimensions. Okay, so that's uh, a wave field is defined in x, z, time, and uh, uh, an offset, okay? uh, and, uh, and then uh, we can have the 3D wave field. All right? So how do we use it back in 706? So we're, uh, you know, this concept of splitting and separation. Uh, we had our wave field, uh, zero offset wave field. We defined it for um, you know, using a thin lens term. Uh, we define it relative to the horizontally average velocity v bar, uh, which can vary any uh, any way uh, any way conceivable in z. Okay, um, so it's x x z t v bar z and uh, zero offset h equals zero. So we had our velocity close to the hor horizontally average velocity. So v of x and z is not too far from the horizontally average velocity v bar, and we had found a downward continuation operator that was like this, okay. And um, there's uh, uh, so dq dz was equal to i omega over uh, uh, v bar z. That was the retardation term, or if you want to call it uh, the uh, uh, time to depth conversion. Now we know. And then there was the thin lens term uh, plus i omega times the quantity one over the, the true laterally variable velocity, v is a function of x and z, okay, minus 1 over v bar z, okay, taking the, the slowness difference between the, um, the true velocity where we're migrating and the horizontally average velocity. That's the thin lens term. And then minus the diffraction term, which is um, v bar z divided. And notice we're not using, we, at this, in, back in 706, we were not using the uh, the full laterally variable velocity for um, um, uh, in the diffraction term, so we had effectively v bar z uh, over two i omega times d uh, d squared dx squared, and all that gets uh, gets applied to the uh, to the retarded uh, retarded wave field q. Now notice that the thin lens operator, okay. Contains a uh, uh, a laterally variable velocity, while the diffraction operator contains a lateral derivative. Okay, they're both in x. Okay, back in this two D uh, world that we were working in at the time, the retardation operator uh, doesn't have either one. Okay, so the retardation operator will commute with the other two, and you can fully separate it. And um, we actually did that in uh, uh, that's in lab nine in the uh, um, the uh, time domain extrapolation. Okay, um, but the uh, the thin lens and the diffraction operators, you know, they're split here. But you can see that that there's a velocity dependence on x in the thin lens operator. There's a there's a x direction derivative in the diffraction operator. So they, those two don't commute, okay. So we have to use splitting, and that's exactly what we did, okay. Um, we uh, and we had an analytic solution in in frequency space for the thin lens term. So uh, we actually uh, uh, we actually implemented that at each depth step, okay. But that's why the uh, the thin lens term was. Uh, was down there uh, inside the uh, uh, the z uh, inside the the z uh, uh, the z loop, 
okay, the, over, you know, creeping down in delta z. So we had to use, uh, we had to use splitting, okay? Uh, if we don't have the thin lens term, right, we could fully separate. You know, we could, uh, we could, we could uh, have the retardation done all at once and then do the diffraction and then unretard it um, uh, later on. So that was the application of this uh, of these ideas of splitting and full separation to um, you know to that uh, this is our extract uh, operator here back from uh, seven oh six uh, I think that was lab eight um, you know uh, something I've often wondered about is uh, a dependence on on velocity. Is uh, in 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 some equation that we're using for computations, okay? It's also an opportunity to analyze velocity, to try to measure velocity, and I've long wondered whether uh, we could use the difference between the split and the separated calculations to determine the degree of velocity variation in x. Um, never uh, never explored that. Okay, so. Um, I want to give you uh, kind of a, uh, a summary of, um, of some uh, 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 some uh, um, uh, migrations. Okay, um, you know this this uh, splitting and full separation business is is kind of a an explanation after the fact of some of the things that we did. Uh, to um, uh, to develop our uh, our two D migrations, and uh, I need to pull pull back a, a little bit and uh, and give you some uh, at least semi realistic examples. So here's some synthetic uh, tests. All right, here's a, a complex Earth model. It's got this. Uh, you, I've shown you this before. It's got that. Um, um, apparent uh, structure that's really just uh, kind of a smooth uh, random structure. It's a Gaussian uh, velocity dependence, okay, centered around um, five kilometers per second, I think, and um, and then there's these low velocity zones um, that uh, intersect. So we got a dipping one and a uh, and a flat one that intersect. So there's the uh, the common midpoint stack, okay, and um, you know as as you've seen, you know that's actually a re this reflection here is a is a rendering of that apparent uh, you know but still random reflect reflect reflector. Uh, there's the uh, dipping part, and of course in the stack it's not it's not intersecting in the right way with the flat part of the low velocity uh, structure. <coughs> Here's a Stolt migration of the stack, okay, using the correct average velocity, you know, above the uh, low velocity zones, and um, there's uh, uh, there's a dipping structure, and you know, it's headed toward the right place, um, especially if we if we depth convert it, okay, that's a, just uh, stretching out the uh, um, the y-axis to to bring it correctly. You know we're not quite recovering the correct dip. Uh, you know even with Stolt migration, even with you know it's a wide angle migration, but it's you know we're feeding at the stack, which has you know uh, decreased the quality of, of the dipping reflection. Uh, we're getting the uh, uh, the flat basin or the flat uh, reflector, and we got it terminating in about the right place at least. Okay, and maybe we're locating some of the Random structure uh, appropriately. Okay, here's a uh, a, a pre-stack Kirchhoff migration. Uh, it's a time migration using that that correct velocity. All dips are recovered accurately, um, and the intersection here is not recovered perfectly, but it's uh, it's pretty good. Um, and then because it's a time migration. You know, getting the continuation of that dipping structure down below the flat structure, uh, we're not really seeing that. And there's distortion of the uh, 
of the thickness of the structure because of the extreme low velocities. Here's some other examples. Uh, I'm sure you guys have seen um, some uh, things that are that are much much better. But um, I still find these uh, useful. Okay. Here's a um, um, a CDP stack. You can obviously see that there's some growth faults in here. At least I think they're growth faults um, that then uh, you know died out um, in the uh, and didn't don't dis don't necessarily disrupt the packages above. Okay, so that's the uh, CDP stack, two dimensional. Um, here's a migration after stack, and uh, you know the um, uh, we're starting to get the terminations along the faults okay. Uh, you know the dips are coming in all right. What what you'd expect. Um, you know is that a reflection from the fault itself? Well, it seems out of place. You know it's not on the right spot. Okay. Um, so um, here's a, a, a pre-stack migration, and. Um, you know, this is probably a situation where velocity variation in in x is not that severe, and it's got the uh, the fault plane reflector, you know, at least closer to the right place now. Okay, right under there, um, and uh, some of the dips, you know, like right up to the fault, right up to the terminations, right up to the intersections, are uh, are much better. So that's a. Uh, uh, this is an idea of what we can do now, okay? Um, given enough uh, enough knowledge, we've uh, been able to progress from uh, uh, from here to here. And what's the difference? Well, um, it's really in locating those steep structures. And of course, what inspired me about this was the ability to see faults as reflectors. Which I, I thought at the time would certainly have applications in tectonics and seismology, um, and I, I went down that path quite a bit. Um, but also, um, turns out it has it's had a big impact on um, on geothermal exploration um, because these um, uh, the fluids. Um, that are included along the faults are the geothermal reservoirs, um, and uh, the reservoirs are, are sometimes in uh, you know some of the fractured volcanic stratigraphy that intersects the faults. But um, if you want to find the pipeline where the hot water is rising in the Great Basin, where uh, most of the geothermal systems are, you know they arise at faults and they are they are fault controlled. Okay, um, then uh, you've got to locate those uh, those steeply dipping reflectors from the fault planes themselves, and so that's uh, that's been a uh, uh, well, unfortunately, only a moderately successful enterprise due to other factors. But in terms of of just the geophysical uh, results alone, it's been a great success. Um, so that's the uh, uh, and of course it required uh, you know not just uh, migration before stack but uh, also true PSDM with uh, with really accurate uh, velocity lateral determinations or really accurate determinations of lateral velocity variation. All right. So uh, next time um, tomorrow, look for a. Uh, a 757 notes number 10, uh, which is going to be this uh, um, Harlan uh, uh, signal noise separation uh, and enhancement uh, lecture, and we'll uh, we'll go into that tomorrow, and then um, after that uh, we're going to have the basic knowledge to begin looking at uh, how we get lateral velocity variation. We're going to talk about tomography, um, and uh, where I'm going to take this for you guys is, you know, once we find out about tomography, once we find out about um, 
operators and uh, tomographic approximations to operators, adjoint operators. We're going to then ap apply that to um, <clears throat> uh, back to uh, pre-stack migration and um, and find out how to uh, um, uh, how to solve the uh, the PSDM and uh, uh, migration through uh, lateral velocity variation uh, problem, um, and and why uh, you know you've seen the solution already, but why does it work? Okay, and and I often talk about uh, something I call reflection tomography, and by that I do not mean um, you know getting the location and the velocity above reflectors. Um, what that really is is uh, um, making a tomographic approximation to the wave equation and deriving all of our uh, migrations from that. So uh, it's going to take a while. We get a lot of concepts yet to absorb, but uh, uh, we're actually going to end up deriving, um, you know, pre-stack depth migration from the wave equation. Um, and uh, that'll help us uh, understand uh, phenomena such as uh, uh, amplitude versus offset as well. <clears throat>